So I'm Dr. David Pearl from Limerence.net and I'm pleased, uh, uh, more than pleased, I'm delighted that we have Sharon on the end of the, uh, the, the, the digital world here um, to talk about her experience with Limerence. And um, just, just to say that obviously with, we're very mindful about protecting people's um, anonymity, you can never say that word. And, and so we're, Sharon's gonna be talking, but just to protect that and be sensitive to that, we're just gonna have her, her lovely dulcet tones. We're not gonna have a, a picture of her. So um, Sharon came onto the Limerence.net forum in November, 2016. And I'm just gonna let her introduce herself, tell her, tell you a bit about, about herself, where she is and her age, and then we'll segue into her journey with Limerence. And uh, so that's Sharon, over to you. Hi, David, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to um, you know, help other people move through the journey of limerence. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sharon. My name is, um, I'm from Wisconsin. I'm 55 years old. Um, my limerent experience began when I was uh, 50 years old. It was kind of a combination of um, the midlife crisis, the menopause, all of that kind of rolled into one. Um, right now, I'm I'm I've been in it for five years, and which is an actually a long time, um, given that it typically lasts about you know up to three years. Um, but um, so I, I think I'm I'm really at the very end of it right now, and I am uh, in for the most part no contact right now. Um, so I'll just kind of start at the beginning and kind of go through this. Uh, I did make some notes on it, which hopefully will help me out here and you as well. Um, so, uh, in my, in my experience, um, and I, I think this might be a rarity that my LO was very accessible to me, um, uh, in that he was literally one minute away from where I lived and, um, uh, that of course made the limerence a lot more difficult for me. Um, so I'm kind of just go for, through the years here. So uh, I met him in March of 2016, and uh, you know found the the, the forum uh, a few months later in November of 16. I would say from uh, 2016 until 18, that was really the point where I was very deeply into the limerence. Um, and then in 2019, um, I was divorced after being married for 28 years. And I would say uh, the limerence had actually highlighted other issues uh, within the marriage that I was really not aware of or didn't want to look at at that time. Um, so, the reason there were a lot of reasons for the divorce, but um, the limerence was just kind of way, way down on the list. Um, and now, um, the past two years, uh, been really working with really working on myself and trying to shift the focus from the LO to myself and to do the heavy lifting and to do the inner work. Um, and now, at present in 2021 there has been a reconnection with my ex-husband uh, over the past several months. And it seems that now the fog has completely lifted, the rose-colored glasses have completely been removed. And so uh, what was there before has become kind of uh, reignited in a way. And this really has surprised me because I never really thought this would happen again. <laughs> Um, even though we, we always remain to be friends, um, we do have a daughter um, together, but um, not, not to the level that it is now. Um, it's a completely different relationship. Uh, the old foundation completely fell to the ground and was dismantled. Uh, I believe that we're working on a new foundation right now. Um, and we're both completely different people. Both of us have changed for the better. So, um, so we're just gonna, we're just kind of going with the flow and kind of seeing, you know, seeing what will happen. Um, 
Did your, did your husband know about your limerence, Sharon? Yes, he did, yes. Um, I actually had told him about it right from the beginning. So um, about two months after I had met L.O., um, you know, there were some, some really just, um, you know, some red flags that had gone up and, you know, uh, you know the, the feelings that I started to have and, and just starting to think about him all the time, you know, I knew that something was not quite right. And yes, I did, uh, I did tell him about it right away. And um, initially his reaction was, it's just kind of an infatuation and it'll just pass and it's part of the whole midlife crisis thing and don't worry about it, it'll be fine. Um, and that actually throughout that, throughout the time, even though he had, he had seen, you know, he knew the LO and he saw what my reaction was to him. Um, he still kind of like pushed it away like, okay, this, this is kind of like your problem or your issue to solve and, um, you know, um, so and he kind of stuck with that. Right. So, so at the end, I, I really, I really felt that he didn't do really anything to, uh, to keep me in that marriage or to fight for me, uh, with a third party threatening that. Well, so well, that's a, that's a, just want to sort of, I know I'm sure. interrupting here, but I think it's such a, it's a commonly asked question, especially by partners of those with limerence and that is you know what what should I do and what would what could he have done in your mind that would have perhaps helped you um kill kill the addiction as it were and moves that energy from the LO to you back to your husband um I think more of a willingness to uh go to couples therapy right. which I had suggested but he he was really against it because he felt like he didn't need that um yeah. so yeah that would be that would have been the number one thing um and i think he really i think he didn't realize how how big this was how big of an issue this was um and and for me to even admit that to myself that yes i had yes i was addicted to this person um much less admit that to him <laughs> um so so yeah, but I would say the counseling would be the number one. Yeah. And 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 also, you know, he he always told me that he never felt threatened by the LO. You know, he always uh he was like, oh well, you know, I'm so much better than him, or I'm this or I'm that. There was no like, there was like absolutely no no threat at all, which surprised me, which there should have been, you know. So I mean, if the situation were reversed absolutely i would feel threatened yeah so um and there was no and and maybe part of that was because there was no you know there was no physical part with the lo okay it was strictly emotional um i think if if that would have been the case then he probably would have went to therapy he probably would have looked at it differently was he not worried that it might have morphed into a physical affair uh, I don't think he was worried about that, no. Okay. No. Yeah, I think we commonly see that that, that men, men, and these are generalizations, that men are more hurt when their wives are, are physically unfaithful and yes. it's the other way around, that women tend to be more hurt when a man has an emotional affair. I know yeah. with my own wife, she actually, the word she actually used was, I'd rather you just fuck that woman and got it out your system than got emotionally uh, tra uh, sort of affixed to her. So I think that's a real a common yeah. issue. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes, that would apply in my case. Yes. And then, so you, so I'm curious as to the path of getting divorced. I mean, how did that, how did that come about, and how did your husband react to that that whole process? Um, like I said, I was still I was still uh, in the limerence, so that was 2018, um, but. I knew if I had chose, if I chose that option, that it, it couldn't be because of LO. It couldn't be of thinking that, you know, everything would be fine and I would be with him and live happily ever after. That couldn't be the reason for it. So then I started looking at the, the other issues that had come up within the marriage and, and actually thought about it for five months 
Um, and then from there, gave him a letter. It was a seven page letter and it had like 17 reasons why I wanted to leave this marriage um, and only two reasons to stay. And he had no idea. He had no idea that, that this was coming, not at all. And uh, he read the letter and he was shocked. He was literally shocked. Um, didn't know, really know how to respond to it. Um, he thought I would never leave, <laughs> quite honestly. So um, it actually took like three months for him to get used to the idea. And I had told him that he was not able to change my mind, that I had already made my decision and that there was really nothing he could do at that point to change it. Um, so then after, you know, three months of kind of getting used to this idea, then, you know, then we started, you know, we filed and, and all of that. It was joint and uh, worked, worked on everything together. You know, it was, it was a very smooth process, um, you know, working, working with him, you know, to work everything out. Um, so he didn't get sort of uh, revengeful or, or try to triangulate your, your child in the process or? No, like not, no, it was very, <laughs> it was, it was very, it was a very smooth process. And it was um, like from start to finish, it was five months. So he just, he, it sounds like he had no fight in him. No, no, none. And, and that, and that too, even though I had told him that um, I wasn't, you know, that he wouldn't be able to change my mind. <clears throat> I kind of thought in the back of mind that mm. he would, you know, that he would have, yeah. <laughs> some anything you know any kind of i want to save this marriage you know we've been you know we've been married for 28 years i want to save this and there was nothing and that surprised me and so that in itself was like okay this is the right decision for me can you can you say a little bit about what some of the issues were that you were unhappy with in the in with your partner i'm um, sure um the, well, the number one, the number one reason was not being the priority, uh, the relationship not being the priority uh, in, in, in over across many years. Um, there were always other people that uh, came before me or came before the marriage, uh, before, the, before the relationship, you know, friends, mostly family. Yeah. Um, and uh, there was an issue of, of gambling as well. Right. Um, and I had, I had kind of tried to, you know, compare the limerence to the gambling, because again, that's an addiction as well. And he just really didn't understand how that was similar. Um, so that was, that was another one. Um, not being emotionally available. And that was, um, that was evident for many years in the marriage. Um, was not able to open up, was not able to share his feelings. Um, the communication in the last, you know, five years was nearly nothing. We didn't talk about anything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, his, you know, his escape from, from me and from the limerence was either the casino or the TV. Right. Um, so those, those were the main, the main mm -hmm. ones. There were there were more there were a couple more but um, those were the main ones yes. So it sounds like I see this so often that his fear of, of going into his feelings and emotions was so great he would rather just the marriage end and not do some deeper soul searching as to what it was for him being a man to you know the, 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 these scripts that we have as men to not fit not not to be emotional not to talk about feelings not and uh, it's such a common issue we see with the marriage counselling that we do. Um, you mentioned you not being the priority, putting his family first, friends and family. And again, um, that's sadly something that we see so often as well. Um, and what about your, one of the things I'm always mindful of with limerence is that the moment we start thinking about our limerent objects, we're back in the addiction. And then this is the trouble with limerence. It's unlike any other addiction that if, you know, with gambling, you've got to go to a betting shop with alcohol you've got to get a drink to get your fix with limerence we don't need that we just need to sit and think about our limerent object and we're back into all those feelings and i just this morning i was writing an article about 
the desire to disclose. And I was going back, and this is more than a decade now, to my own journey. And I could feel myself going back into the whole, into the whole thing again um, and getting a bit hypervigilant. I mean, and so for you, with your limerent object so close, and, I, and I'd be curious to know if they are still very close. I mean, can you tell us a bit about that side of the, uh, of the triangle? You know, you've told us a bit about your husband. This mm. is, you know, you're, you're in the, it's a, this triangular relationship, which limerence invariably is. Can you tell us a bit about the limerent object and how you managed no contact disclosure, all those sorts of things? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, yeah, um, he is, he is still, um, he is still close to me. Um, I'm the one that moved out. So now he, instead of being a minute away, he's eight minutes away, um, <laughs> which is better. But um, I had told, I had told uh, my ex-husband that uh, even if we had not gotten divorced, we would have been, had to be separated and I would have had to either move out or we have uh, to relocate yeah. because I could not, I could not do that part of the work um with having that access so close to me absolutely not and i i think now he understands that better he can he can kind of correlate it more to the gambling you know using the example of it's like the casino being a minute away yeah and he's like oh okay i i get he does he does get it now which is which is good i wish he had gotten it a couple of years ago but you know no so um yeah um, and actually, no, um, I do, I do see the LO on occasion. Um, we use the same roads, unfortunately, and I have, I do see him, you know, at most several times a month on the same road. And, um, I kind of always have the same re reaction to him. Um, <laughs> it just, it just kind of spins me in a circle like for the whole day i'm just right. like i do have a, a spin out basically until i'm able to like <laughs> gather myself again <laughs> and and then move forward um so what really what really helped me actually was um i have not had any communication or interaction with the lo uh for two and a half years it'll be three years in august um at that time i at my last interaction uh, he was very, he was very cold to me and I had decided right then and there that I wasn't going to stop anymore. Um, he, cause being, being very accessible, I can see him from the road and, um, he works at the school that our kids went to and, um, I could pull in at any time right. <laughs> to talk to him. But I had, I had decided at that time that this is the last time I am not doing this again. I'm not putting myself in this position anymore. So the sole fact that there has been no contact and there has been no, um, you know, nothing on his end, no effort to contact me, um, that has really helped me quite a bit. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, um, so that's a good thing, and I, I'm I'm sticking with that. So you could have li you literally just looked out of your front room window and got your fix, got your. Yeah, it was yeah, like I said, a minute. It was a minute drive away. <clears throat> right. Um, to pass by the school, and you know, yeah, I would see him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's hard. Do you think? I mean, one of the questions I'm often asked is that can I can I get over this without having to go no contact without, you know, it's often in a work environment where somebody's in the right. same work. And right. uh, I'd like to, you know, what's your view? Do you think you could have got over this if you hadn't moved eight, eight minutes further away and got him out, got Absolutely. more physical distance? Absolutely not. <laughs> I've thought about it quite a bit. And yeah. um, it was at the very worst in this when I was deep in the limerence um, it basically became my whole life. Um, all I was concerned with was driving by and getting hits. And that's, that's how it was for, I would say, six months to a year. Uh, I wasn't interested in anything else, um, was not even able really to take care of my family or you know, do, my, do my chores or whatever, because he became the sole focus of my life. I gave, I gave all my power away to him. 
And um, at the very height of it, uh, I was driving by, the, I was driving by like probably eight to 10 times a day, yeah. every day, every day. Yeah. And, and, and just, just being in that and doing that and just feeling this, this complete loss of control. And the days that I did not see him um, feeling this utter emptiness within myself. Um, it was, it was so, it, it, I probably was the worst emotional pain that I have experienced in my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. And, and, and so, and this so often I hear that, that limerence becomes a gateway to doing some deeper healing work. So what, what, what did you, what, what things have you done? What's helped you on this journey to get you to where you are now? Um, well, um, I would say the main thing, trying to move the focus off the LO to myself, which is very, very difficult to do. Um, one of the more challenging aspects of the limerence is that the thinking and the ruminating about the LO 24 seven. You know, from the time you wake up until the time you go to bed, that person is in your mind and you're thinking about what they're doing and how they feel about me and interpreting actions that I would, you know, or positions that I would see him in and then, you know, analyzing that and interpreting that, well, he did this, so that must mean that, and this is how it affects me and <laughs> all of it, all of that, it just becomes like the center of your existence. Yeah. Um, so having gone through that for, like I said, at least a year, if not two, um, bringing that focus back to myself. And I actually, um, I started having uh, Reiki done uh, like two years ago. And that really helped me a lot, um, you know, with the energy component of it. And, you know, that I was just pouring all this energy into this person and not into myself at all. So, um, so she really helped me to, um, to bring it back to myself and to look at what, what he was triggering in me because there were, there were so many triggers over such a long period of time that I was not even really aware of. Um, so like, for example, every time I would see him, I would, um, I would just get really upset and I'd be really angry and I would start, you know, spewing profanity and uh, I didn't know why. <laughs> and so she helped, she helped me to, you know, kind of figure some of that out. And um, so main, mainly, you know, the two, the, the two core wounds of abandonment and rejection. Yeah. Um, and I think the last two years I, I've been working specifically with those. Um, and without going into any detail, yeah. because the last thing I want to do is sort of trigger you here. Um, but are, <laughs> you, are, are you able just to name what the, what, the, those, what the rejection and abandonment was that set you up for this pattern? You mean from, well, from childhood? Well, like yeah, that. I'm, I'm making an assumption it's child childhood. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Abs absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, well, I, I can use uh, the example of um, like rejection or um, being ignored. I will use that one because that one was huge. Right. Um, which had actually happened right from the very beginning. Uh, when his SO was around, I was ignored. Like I didn't exist. When she was gone, it was, hey, how's it going, right? You know, so it was right from the very beginning like that. Um, and it has continued up to this point. So um, the, like the last time that I saw him on the road, um, he was right in line with my vehicle. And, you know, I looked at him, make sure it was him, right? Yeah, he ignored me the entire time. This was like a 10 minute route, which I should have turned off, but I did not. Uh, he ignored me the entire time. And that just, it just every single time has struck me to my very core yeah. because um, my mom ignored me a lot right. growing up. Um, you know, like, I don't have time for you. Go do something else. Or, yeah. um, you know, my mom was emotionally avail unavailable as well. Um, so that, that was a huge trigger for me. 
Um, and I'm still kind of working on that. Yeah. Um, and what about, was, was dad around at all? Was that what, I'm sorry? Was your dad, your father, was he around in your life? Yes, he was around as well, yes. How, um, how present was he? How emotionally present? Um, he was he was physically there, but uh, not so much emotionally, no. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's what I hear again so often, that dads, even if they're physically present, they're just, they're emotionally absent. They're, they're elsewhere, yeah. Yes, and Ella was the same way. He fit the same pattern. Yeah, yeah. Yes, he was married and not available. Anyway. And, did, and did you, I mean, did you ever talk to your LO? Did you speak to him? Did you disclose anything of, of what you were going through at all? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, I disclosed uh, several times, probably <laughs> four or five times, uh, both verbally and uh, in letter form. Uh, I had even early on, I would say within the, the first six months of, of being in this, obviously, love obsession, that's what I you, the term that I used, um, I had told him directly about the limerence and this is what I have and this is what's going on with me. And um, he was like, well, thanks for letting me know. And that was- That was it, <laughs> that you got that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I felt like he was, it was act actually my disclosure of that was like uh, giving him a free pass to um, yeah. you know, use that for all that he could get. Yeah. And because it was a lot about the attention and the admiration and all of that stuff. Okay. For a very long time. And um, yeah, it was a free pass for him. Yeah, absolutely. So in hindsight, when you reflect back now, disclosure perhaps wasn't a good thing. Is that what you're saying? Um, probably, probably not. But I think if I had to go, if I could go back and do it differently, I, don't, I think I would still disclose because I had, it was so, it was so intense and the feelings that I had were so intense. I have never really experienced that before yeah. ever, you know, in, in, in all my years. Yeah. Um, and I felt so, I felt that so strongly for him and the feelings so strongly for him. Um, and I mean, when I would see him, it was like a bomb went off every single time. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I feel like I would have told him at some point in time, he needed to know how, how strongly I felt for him, yes. And, and how did it all start? What, what do you mean, like? Huh? The, the limerence, I mean, did, had you known this person before or did you, had you just set eyes on him and in that moment that was it? Or, or... <laughs> no, um, no, we volunteered at the school that our kids went to. Right, and, and so, uh, yeah, go, so met, go. met there, yes, met there. And both volunteers and you know there were events that we were always at you know we did uh, playground duty together and you know just started talking and just felt really comfortable with him very at home with him um and just when i was with him i felt like electrified almost it was like sticking my finger in a light socket Right. And I didn't, I didn't know what that was. I never experienced that with anyone. Um, and so I would say it took probably about two months. And then at that point, I mean, that was, that was part of the, part of that process where you suddenly become very aware of how you are appearing to that other person, you know, spending more time on your clothes and, and, and getting ready for your interaction um, or rehearsing what I, would, what I would say to him for days before the actual interaction. And that was something that I had never done with, with any other situation. And so that in itself was very foreign to me. Um, and was that energy there right from day one with him or did it gradually sort of grow upon you? It gradually did, yes, yes. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I would say like the first month it was like, okay, well, you're nice to talk to and whatever. And then, and then after two months, I, it was weird. I, I actually like heard a, uh, like a switch had flipped in me and I just stepped back and I was like, whoa, oh my goodness. Like, yep, you're, you're it, you know, you, you are it. And, and really from that moment, that's when like, the, it was like a limerence switch yeah. <laughs> switched on and then 
you know, by then I, I had already like hit the floor. And then that summer, it was like summer vacation. And every day for three months, I thought about them every single day. So it just, right. it sort of crept up on you. And it was too, by the time you realized it was too late, the switch had been flipped. Yes, yes, yes. I, it was funny. I, I, on May 4th, I had my 25th wedding anniversary. Everything was fine. I was fine. I was happy, right? Three weeks later, I was not fine. <laughs> so, yeah. And do you know anything about your LO that has helped you better understand yourself? What, what perhaps early life wounds that you might mirror in each other? Do you know anything of that at all? Um, I, well, I think, um, you know, being, well, I, I was kind of a combination of empath and narcissistic traits. Right. So I think, I think the, I think I mirrored a lot of the narcissistic traits in him that I was not even aware of. Um, I, I acted a certain way, but I didn't know why. Yeah. Um, for example, uh, and I, I was very, I'm very different now than I was five years ago. Absolutely. <clears throat> a completely different person. And all of the traits that he brought to light, I no longer, they're like no longer there because I've healed them now. Um, but I would say, um, you know, I was very impulsive. I was very reckless. Um, I was controlling. I had to control everything and everybody. Manipulative as well. I tried to manipulate him, but I think he was probably the master at that and I was never successful. Like I kind of met my match. <laughs> it's exactly what my own therapist said to me. <laughs> You're echoing her words. You've met your match. <laughs> Somebody equally narcissistic. Um, <laughs> yes. So, so uh, for you, it was a, like a real epiphany. It was a real, uh, a, an awakening. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, yes. I, now I, I do believe that he was the catalyst that I needed to you know, I, I did have a spiritual awakening as a result of, of deliverance as, as a result of this experience, yes. Can you say a bit more about the spiritual aspects for you? Um, well, uh, I was raised Catholic. Right. And, you know, I went to private Catholic schools, um, you know, my whole life. Um, never really thought, never really knew about other religions being out there or was was very, um, you know, that, that was it, you know, um, that was the traditions and that was it. Um, so really, uh, really kind of started to question that a little bit. Uh, I had talked to the, I had talked to the parish, uh, priest about this situation and really, really left with a feeling of, uh, he, he actually compared the LO to a chocolate bar that's in the drawer that you really want to take out, but you know, you shouldn't. <laughs> and I thought that was so ludicrous. All right. And I, I was just kind of blown away. And I'm just like, you know what? Just really starting to question that to everything, you know, and the people, the other people that I were in contact with, you know, um, you know, gossiping, hypocritical, just everything opposite of, you know, of, be, of, be, of what being a Catholic was or being a Christian was. Yeah. So I really started there and I really started looking at that um, and then kind of moved away from that. And, you know, with the Reiki as well, that's more on the spirituality end of it yeah. um, and the universal end of it. And so started, started going that way, um, you know, of, you know, the universe and, you know, uh, divine creator and, you know, just kind of reading about that. And that was more um, appealing to me than what I had grown up with. So what I'm hearing is more about sort of faith versus dogma. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, you know, my, my daughter's been raised Catholic as well. And, um, you know, sometimes she will say to me, well, I bet you didn't go to church last week. And, and then I just say, or I just tell her that, you know, their organized religion is, is just indoctrination. Yeah. Spirituality is a completely different thing. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, you know, she, I mean, that's, that's what I believe now. And she just kind of, well, okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I don't think she, she doesn't really understand it yet, but she's young. She's 16. So she's, she, she has time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Just complete 360. Wow. And my, my outlook and my viewpoint of everything is just completely different, completely right. changed because of this. Yeah. And did, I know that you use the forum um, to, to help support you. Did you have any close friends or family that you could confide in to help you, support you? Um, yeah, my, uh, my sister, my only sister, um, she knew about it from the beginning. Um, as, as soon as I kind of had that, the inkling that, oh, you know, there's this, this awesome person, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, she, she was with me from the, from the very beginning, um, all the, all the way through, you know, all the way through the end now. And she still, she still is. So yes, yes. And how important was that for you to have somebody else that you could share some of this burden with? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it was, it was, I mean, I would constantly be, I mean, she didn't understand. She didn't understand what that was like and all of that, you know, and so, you know, trying to explain it from that view, but I think just listening, just listening to me um, or, you know, when I would have a interaction with LO and, you know, I would just be like, you know, really, really up there wondering, wandering around, you know, <laughs> um, you know, she, she would just listen. That was the most important thing. And were there any books that really helped you on your journey? Um, I did, I did read, you know, quite a bit of, of books. I remember, uh, I remember in September. So this was, you know, after like school had started again, this was after I disclosed to him um, getting, getting, being surrounded by like seven or eight books all about love obsession and, you know, what to do when you're obsessed with someone and just sitting in the, in the midst of these books and, and just being, you know, completely clueless and like, okay, well, I, I know that something's going on and I don't know what it is, but I need to start somewhere. And I think I'm supposed to start here. <laughs> and so just, just, you know, beginning to read these books and, and have somewhat of an understanding of what was going on with me, because I, I literally did not have a clue what was happening to me. Yeah. And what if somebody who's just developed limerence or just come across the forum or is listening to this, this recording, what, what advice would you give to them? Um, <laughs> that's a very difficult question um well what would what advice would you give to yourself five years ago i would say to to have an awareness to be well first of all to be aware of uh any red flags that drop in the beginning because that yes there were red flags like in that first two month period um you know, the ignoring being one, um, but to not try to justify them right away. I mean, that's what I did. Um, or I just pushed them away. I just ignored them. Yeah. Flat out. Uh, not realizing that this would be such a, that this would blow up and, su and just be, be such a <laughs> process or such a journey um, to definitely be, have an awareness of those. And um, also uh, to, to have an awareness of your behaviors and how they change when you're, when you're with the LO or when you see the LO, uh, because I think that's, that's really not even, we're not even really aware of that, of that reaction that that person is provoking in you. Yeah. I wasn't. Um, you know, I, all of a sudden I was just hit and I was like, you know, no idea what was happening. Um, so to kind of like have an awareness to prevent it from almost preventive to have it get to that next point of obsession because it happens very fast. It's like, it's almost like a domino effect. Yeah. 
that it just once one starts that that's it. <laughs> and I think once you're once you're in that obsession, it is very, very difficult to pull it back from there. Yeah. Yeah, we have to, we only have a finite period of time and we have to know ourselves well enough to know that when we're getting that feeling that we, we've got only a, a short window of opportunity to head it off with the paths, to do a 180, turn away, just avoid that person because we know they're going to be dangerous for us. Right. And um, I really didn't, you know, I didn't know myself well enough yeah. either. Um, I really, I was not, you know, I was a people pleaser. I was a giver you know, my whole life and, you know, now learning to be on the, the receiving side of that um, and to, you know, uh, to turn away from, you know, the codependency, you know, all of that, all of that stuff. Um, so, so yes. yes. Yeah, I've often described limerence as codependency on steroids. Yes, absolutely. And I think, <laughs> I, I think, I suspect, um, all, all limerent, all people with limerence are codependent to some degree or other. Um, I do have a question for you. I'm not sure if you could answer it, but yeah, um, sure. yeah turn the yeah. table. What do you want to ask me? <laughs> <laughs> um, just, you know, like I said, I, you know, this, and this has been a really long journey for me. It's been five years. And like I said, I, I'm, I'm pretty much like, I'm, I'm in a good place with it. Um, but I do wonder, you know, is this, is this going to be, I, I think it'll be, the limerence will be a part of me, you know, probably for the rest of my life. Um, yeah. But is there ever going to be a point in time where there will be no thought of LO that comes in, in on any given day? Because I, I haven't reached that point yet. Yeah, um, I can only speak for myself um, okay. and, and obviously cl the clients that I've worked with. I think when we've gone no contact, then after a period of time and for me i would say it was three or four years after no contact and i was mm -hmm. in contact for five years so for nine years for me i think after about three or four years there were periods and i remember once going to uh, going to bed at night because that would be always the time where i would dwell on elo just before going to sleep and i remember waking up in the morning and thought oh i hadn't thought of her and now i mean i'm now what 11 11 coming up for 12 years probably I very I very rarely think of her hardly ever only you know if I'm working on the forum or doing or working with a client then then sometimes that might bring back some memories or here just listening up to your story but but it's very fuzzy and I, it's so long since I've seen my limerent object that that they're not intrusive and they're not troubling um so yeah I believe that but then I've I think we also have to do that deeper psychological work, the grieving work as well. You, know, you touched on, on abandonment issues. And, and I, I think when we've worked on those and we know ourselves at a much deeper level, then it gets much easier. But what I do know is that, um, I mean, I don't think I'll get limerence again because I will be able to spot it. Um, and I know the type of woman that's likely to trigger me. Um, and as a therapist, if I did get those feelings, I would just go back into supervision and work on it. But it, it hasn't happened in all the years. But what I do, uh, you know, and I do believe that I just want to sort of share, share an interesting experience that happened today. Um, but it's this, the early life wounds that we carry, and you know, I'm not a great believer, as you probably read in Soulmates or Twin Flames. When we have that strong connection with another human, it's early life and it might even be transgenerational wounds. And I had a chat with another, uh, a man this morning and um, we had a real deep connection. He's very much into men's work as I am. And we were sharing our stories, but in a really, tr a really honest way, we were being incredibly open about our journeys, our sexuality, our pasts, um, male sexual abuse, which is a common, well, one in six men, and certainly it runs probably in my family and his family too. And we had a real strong connection. And I came away from that chat and I was, I was buzzing. I was energized from it. I got really um, fueled up. I could feel it. And it was a little bit like those feelings of limerence. But because it was a man and I wasn't attracted to him, there was none of that sexual energy there. Now, had it been an attractive woman and we'd had a similar extremely open honest conversation that's just the situation where 
I could be back into into it. But I, I know I know to avoid those situations. I mean, I would never, as a therapist, I'm not disclosing that level of intimacy with a female client or, or a male client. Um, here I do be, um, to some degree because it's trying to help others. Um, so I think the more we know ourselves, the, the easier it is to deal with it. I, I still, you know, I'm, I'm a love addict at, at my heart. I always know, I'm in, in the 12 steps, they talk about scanning a room, that when we're love addicted, we'll go into a room and, and um, a man certainly, he's always scanning to see if there's an attractive woman there. It's what we're wired, genetically wired to do that. It's an evolutionary mechanism to get us to procreate and it, it's in all men. And, and I will notice a beautiful woman. I was at Costco this morning and I just noticed myself looking around at women. Um, nothing wrong in that. I'm a man and, and when I stop doing it, that's, that's when I'm going to worry because I've probably stopped breathing. <laughs> but the thing is, it's knowing myself that I'll have a look for one or two seconds and that's it. Move on. Don't get too fixated. Um, and certainly if it's in a social situation where there, there, there's that energy there, um, I would move on. I, I wouldn't be flirting which which the old David would have done to get my own narcissistic supply in that in that situation so I I think the more we know ourselves and the more time that passes then yeah eventually th those feelings do do go um, it does take time and that's the the other thing that I'm you know and I'm, I'm really interested about and again I had a chat with it this morning with this other guy is is the use of psychedelics and psychotherapy together i mean one of my biggest frustrations is is that psychotherapy counseling it's coaching it's slow work it doesn't changes don't happen quickly um, and there's some really fascinating research coming out that's that's combining um, psychedelics um, like ayahuasca and um, psilocybin which is magic mushrooms with with psychotherapy for people that have very resistant addictions. And I just wonder if there's some, some way there in the future when I think California is gonna be legal or there's a, a move to legalize psychedelics in California. And I, I think, I, I wonder if there's with, in the years to come that there's gonna be more effective drug treatment programs to help people with resistant addictions. And, uh, you know, and I've, I believe limerence is the root of all addiction. And I think it's the mother of all addiction or, or love addiction, not necessarily limerence, but you know, it's that addiction to being seen and, and, and validated, which is at the root of codependency. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do agree with that. Absolutely. Um, and just the point that you made about knowing yourself, uh, you know, going into this, I did not know myself well yeah. um, at all. Yeah. And so that was another part of it that opened up for me was um, the self care yeah. and to love myself um, because I was always, you know, looking for, you know, that validation or that attention from someone else. Yeah. Um, and that, that was another really big trigger for me as well. Um, so just, you know, discovering that. And I, I and that's, I think that is a, a lifelong process to, <laughs> to really love yourself and accept yourself as you are, um, and, you know, change the things that you are able to change and leave the rest. Yeah, to be, to be, to accept that we only have to be perfectly imperfect, as my yes. therapist used to yes. say. And to, yes, and to be okay with that. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, last year I, I did uh, do a blog um, on my experience, and uh, it's basically a documentation by year of all of my experiences, um, you know, moving through the limerence uh, from start to finish. Um, and I just want to give you the link, you know, if you're interested, uh, go take a look at it. Um, but you can really see the process and the progress uh, that is quite painful at times um, in, in moving through and, uh, you know, resolving this. Um, so the link is soul work journey. It's all one word dot org. Okay, so what, what I'll do is I'll put that link uh, um, in the description of the video as well so that people can... Oh, okay, uh, great. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, great. Um, and, you know, any, uh, anything that helps people get the name of Limerence out there because it's still so misunderstood and certainly in the therapeutic world 
Um, most therapists are ignorant about this and don't understand the depth of desperation that people go through when they're right. in yeah. this. Yeah, this yeah. and I, I just wanted to, sorry to interrupt, I, I just wanted to mention too that um, I was in therapy also um, at kind of at the same time that I was doing the Reiki, uh, I was in therapy for two years, um, you know, my therapist had not heard of limerence, um, her background was in eating disorders, but that part of it could relate to yeah. the obsession and the yeah. Um, you know, all, all of that. So was really able to relate to that. And uh, that helped me so much. Yeah, um, really did a lot. And I, I actually did group therapy for codependence for six months, which also helped. And, and, and I, I think group therapy is so valuable as well. I mean, how, how did that you find that experience of, of group therapy? Yeah, I mean, I had never done that before. And uh, it was it was a small group, uh, probably about uh, seven or eight of us that would yeah. meet weekly. Um, and, and just, I mean, just that, that common ground of like, we're all, we're all codependents here. And, and just, you know, all of the, the, the situations and the experiences, you know, that everyone would, yep, I've been there. Yep. I'm in that now. Yes. You know, just absolutely, uh, really beneficial to be in that. Yeah, I, I, I think group therapy is invaluable as well. It sort of replicates our early life family dynamics and that we learn also so much in groups as well. So we've been going nearly an hour and I sort of, sort of time to wrap up. Um, just, just sort of finally, just to bring it full circle. So you mentioned um, that you're back in connection with your husband or your ex-husband. -hus yes. Um, and sort of, do you have any thoughts about where to from here or, or what, you know, where are you with all, the next part of your journey? Um, well, uh, the communication is, uh, is, it's really, it's just unbelievable. We communicate more now than we ever did when we were married. <laughs> and uh, he's a lot more open. And I think just from the experiences that he's gone through and, and actually me physically leaving yeah, um, has really, you know, changed him for the better. Um, and I still talk about the limerence. I, I still talk about, you know, the different aspects of it to him. Um, on the occasion that I do see LO, I talk to him about that, you know, and, and I think he understands it more because he's, he's been hearing about it, you know, for all these years um, and how that still impacts me. And we, we talk about that and, you know, I ask for his opinion. Well, how can I do this differently? Or what can I do to remove myself from that situation? Uh, he put a post in my car that says, um, disengage <laughs> immediately. So like, if you, you know, if you see him disengage, get out of there right away. Yeah. You know, don't even, don't even step into that. Don't even acknowledge that. So I have that. It's been in my car for like two months, <laughs> which is really good. So he's actually, helping me you yeah. know that which is something that he was he was not able or willing to do before um so that i mean uh discussions you know not just about limerence but uh anything and everything you know our daughter it is absolutely you know, 360 that it was before um and i think he he is he is becoming more available emotionally um which is a really good thing so, um, and just spending time together, you know, just hanging out or going out to eat or watching a movie or whatever, and just enjoying being together. Um, and has, so, he done, has he done any deeper work on himself? Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's, it's possible. Um, I, I can say that before he used to be very negative, like his, like what he would say or his thoughts would be very negative. Um, and he's able to turn that around a little bit and look at things from a positive, more positive, like the glass is half full instead of half empty. Right. Um, so I, I'm assuming that that's some kind of inner work. And I, I mean, it might be from my influence too on him sure. regarding that, but I think that's probably yeah. the start of it, you know, the start of it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, um, I, okay. Yeah. Any other quick questions from you to me before we wrap up? 
No, I don't have any questions for you. Okay, great. Uh, I really appreciate you being so gracious and generous in your time, with your, well, both your honesty and, and your time as well in, in the pursuit of helping others as well. Um, Absolutely. Great to hear your voice behind, uh, and I've obviously read some of your posts, so I know, know of you on the forum. And uh, I really wish you well, wherever your journey takes you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, David. Okay, go well, Sharon. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.